The moment when I saw myself on a you know, MLB baseball card was you know, very special. You know, I definitely dreamed of that day since I was a little kid. So, you know, um, I still I actually have it, the first card, my rookie card. So, uh, I'll keep that one safe. Welcome to MLB's Carded, presented by the eBay Vault, home of the hobby. Visual appeal has always been a key part of any successful baseball card design, but Topps took things to a whole new level with Project 70 and Project 2020. They brought in contemporary artists to blend their aesthetic with baseball cards to create a whole new product, and the designs are a hit with collectors and art fans alike. So what does Topps have in store for 2022? Well, we asked them. Project 2020 was a, a Topps initiative merging the art world with baseball cards. For a long time, we wanted to capitalize on some of the peripheral collectible industries like art and sneakers and wanted to pair with influencers in that area and make a baseball card. So we, we landed on 2020, obviously it plays on a year, but it was also 20 rookie cards created by 20 artists. What we found was people really liked learning about artists and the art world and it became the brand that started a new sector of what we do. Project 70, similar concept of partnering with artists to create baseball cards. This time, however, we celebrated 70 years of Topps baseball designs and it was really all about honoring Topps history. And the idea was how do we carry this forward? There was a lot fans loved about that stuff. We also heard feedback on what they would like to see in the future. And ultimately what we landed on is Project 100. It's not tied to an anniversary this time around. It's not tied to the year. The brand is really about a smaller, more focused 100 card set that gives the opportunity to fans to collect the entire set. We're partnering with artists, 20 artists, and having them create baseball cards. But what we've done is really take a lot of the learnings from the last years and try to make an elevated, more premium, and more focused product this time. Project 100 is split into four seasons spring, summer, fall, winter. And the idea there is to create small, more curated focused experiences. So season one is five weeks long. It's five artists, five cards each for a 25 card subset. And we'll do that four times to get to 100. Season one cards launch every Tuesday at noon Eastern, only at tops.com. And they're available while supplies last. We hear over and over again, whether you're a collector in the hobby currently, or you collect it as a kid, it's fun to collect this. It's fun to uh, see what art comes each day. So it's a really accessible product because whether you like the player or the team or the artist or the art style, there's a little bit something for everybody. Project 100 is sure to provide collectors with some interesting cards, but sometimes it's not a beautiful, thoughtful design that makes a card interesting. Sometimes it's just an outright mistake. Card collectors have seen more than a few error cards that featured the wrong player. My buddies Al Leiter and John Smoltz each had one where they were swapped out with a teammate. I have both of them. But what about getting it wrong with someone who was even closer than a teammate? I'll let Astros coach Gary Pettis explain. I was at home and I had a friend that had called me and he says, hey, he says, you know, you really look young on your 1985 uh, Topps baseball card. And I thought, well, I mean, I'm 24 or 25, so I considered that to still be pretty young. And I just kind of shrugged it off and didn't think anything else about it. And one day uh, during the season, someone showed me the card and I went, oh my gosh, now I see what he was talking about because it, the card wasn't me it's was my 14 year old brother so yes i did look pretty young to him and i think this particular day it was a sunday afternoon and uh, one of my teammates juan boniquez he had a son that would always come out and my brother at the time who was 14 but he was just as big as i was uh, they became friends, and so they would go out on the field and run around and chase fly balls and stuff like that. And I think that they saw him uh, and obviously didn't really uh, recognize that this was just a 14-year-old kid and wanted to 
maybe grab a photograph of me, you know, maybe not so much doing a something related to baseball and took a picture of him in the dugout. At least that's that's what I remember. <laughs> oh, my. He was so excited. I mean, uh, you know, you think about a 14 year old kid and he's on a baseball card that's being circulated all throughout the country. He became an a, a instant hit with a lot of his his friends and, uh, you know, a lot of my friends. <laughs> I have fun with it. I mean, you know, I can only imagine what it would have been like for me at 14 years old to have my own baseball card. I mean, I, I, I think it's great. You know, one of the great things about baseball cards is they help capture and preserve a moment. This next collection not only features some of the greatest players in baseball history, but helps capture and preserve a legacy. So my name is Al Dragella, and I have a real unique uh, collection of Negro League baseball cards. It's such an important part of baseball history, and there are no cards issued in the United States of American uh, Negro League players. Almost everything you'll see in my collection is much more scarce than the T206 Honest Wagner. Some people talk about the 1952 Mickey Mantle card as being very rare. You know, there's thousands of those. There are only a handful of many of these artifacts of some of the most amazing players that few people have ever heard about. You know, one of the holy grails of, of collecting is a Josh Gibson card from the Tolotero set out of Puerto Rico. The, the interesting thing about this card is that the photograph is actually when he played in Puerto Rico in the early 40s, but this was issued as a homage to him after his passing. The Negro Leagues changed. There's all sorts of different leagues at different times. There's pre-Negro Leagues, you know, before the Eastern Color League of the 1920s. So it's kind of a mix match. And a lot of the players would go where they'd get the highest pay, right? And many times this was in Latin American countries, you know, uh, Mexico, Venezuela, Cuba, and slowly through the last, you know, I'd say 25 years has been an acceleration of finding cards that were issued in Latin American countries that really depict these early Negro League stars. They weren't seen to be that valuable at first, but as Hall of Fame collectors, you know, they're like, wow, this is amazing. I've never even knew this card was issued. Like for instance, and even non-Negro League players like Luis Aparicio, you know, who's a Hall of Famer, you know, Chicago White Sox. He's from Venezuela and there's a card issued of him as a kid in Venezuela well before there's the Major League cards. So it was a very interesting sub-segment and it continues to evolve. We continue to find new albums uh, that, that include players from, that played in the Negro Leagues that are issued in Latin America. One of my favorite sets is a 1927-28 Mallorquina set. And this set is, is interesting because you can see the really small size of these cards. And they were issued in Carmel's. So the probability that a kid would keep these and they would survive is next to nothing given the size of these cards. It's actually a miracle. But what's really important about this is there's only 20 professional players on it. Unbelievably, there's four Negro Leaguers in this and, and three of them ended up being Hall of Famers, which makes it a treasure trove for, for Negro League baseball collectors. And in fact, Hall of Fame collectors in general. One of the marquee cards from the set is this Willie Foster card. So Willie Foster is a Hall of Famer, and this is his only known card, and this is the only known copy. He's on this uh, uncut sheet, but this is the only one with a stamped back that would have been given to a kid in his, with his little Carmel. Caramelos Peloteros, baseball Carmels. This tiny little artifact survived. Equally important in this set is the rookie card of Martin de Higo. This is again, the only known copy of this card outside of the sheet. So these cards are, you know, at the pinnacle of my collection due to the, the, the scarcity, the beautiful, the, the, the beauty and the photography, even though it's small, is just magical. One of the, the amazing things about the Negro Leagues is they had many players that were like Shohei Otane. 
great pitchers and great batters. And Martin De Higo's the only player to be in five Hall of Fames. Cooperstown, Mexican Hall of Fame, Venezuelan, uh, Cuban, and the Dominican Republic. So he also played every position. And in one year, he actually was not only, he won the equivalent of the Cy Young, but he also was a batting champ, which is crazy to think about. He's also the guy that has the only baseball card that has Hildale on it, which is a Negro League team, which um, is something that's kind of special to the collecting world. If you want a Negro League player that has a Negro League jersey on, this is the only card that gets that done for you. 1931 out of Venezuela. I was at a baseball card show. I don't know how, how old I was, probably you know, 12, 13 or something. My mom brought me, drove me an hour to go to this baseball card show. Again, this is the highlight of my uh, of my youth. And you know, I needed to go waste my $10 and I probably did that in 30 minutes, but I wanted to spend all day there. And I'd walk around from table to table and I ran into to, uh, a gentleman by the name of Lou Dials, who was a Negro League player. And I started to talk to him and I'm just a kid. And he was so charismatic, I mean, a storyteller. And I sat down and just listened to him for hours telling me these stories of all these players that I had never heard in, the, in my you know, studies when I was you know, going back and learning about more vintage players. You know, Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, Judy Johnson, you know, and he would tell all these stories. You know, some of it was probably lore and some of it was reality, but it really piqued, piqued my interest. And, and I felt like it was a segment that uh, I felt the calling to because of this man that I randomly met. This is a card that I think should be one of the premier cards uh, for Negro League collectors. It's a 1923-24 Biakin, and this is issued out of Cuba, and it shows the great Oscar Charleston. One of the fantastic things about these cards is that they're photographic in nature, not just cardboard. So if you look at the paper, it's actually photographic paper. It has a beautiful image of Oscar Charleston here, who was just one of the best players in the Negro Leagues for 20 plus years. You know, Pop Lloyd is, is somebody who we talked about and we should because he's one of the best shortstops ever. And this is his uh, Thomas Gutierrez card. Just a, I love the smile. You can see the charisma. One of the things you love about, that I love about baseball cards is you get the feeling for the, the, the player, the person, their, their aura. And here it's just all about positivity. I love uh, this Pop Lloyd card. My favorite card, my favorite Negro League card is this 1910 Punch Jose Mendez card with the original back. So they have a little bit of this um, this border on the back. There's an album that you could return. That's what the back says, actually. You can see here in the back. It says you can return these cards to a specific address and they'll give you an album. I think if I had to pick one Negro League card in my collection to keep, this would have to be it for me just because of what it means to Negro League card collecting in terms of the, the scarcity of the back, the image of the player, and just the importance of the issue. I think it's really important to, to, to conserve all history. And this is a really important piece to me of, of American history. We're not gonna deny the fact that segregation existed, which is ugly, that racism existed, but something beautiful came out of this. And that's the Negro Leagues and all this wonderful baseball that was played. And, it, and this happened not just in the US, but throughout many countries, you know, from Latin America to Japan. These guys were heroes. They enjoyed the game. They really uh, were an important part of baseball history, even if it wasn't just in the major leagues. That's it for this episode of MLB's Carded, presented by the eBay Vault. Say hello to the future of collecting. Uh, before we go, we've got a pack rip with New York Mets legend Mookie Wilson. What year do you think we gave him? 1986, of course. We'll see you next time. 1986 top baseball card, 1986 Mets. Hopefully all the old Mets are in here. I'm gonna rip it open, and if I get lucky, you might hear some really interesting stories. So let's see what happens. Ah. Uh. Oh, well, first of all, we got bubble gum. There's no tobacco in there, so that's a good thing. All righty. Let's see what we got here now. Oh, Andre Dawson, the Hulk. 
one of the slowest talking guys you ever want to meet. And I tell you what, he was dangerous. Probably one of the best 5-2 players in all of baseball. Hall of Famer. You know him, Andre Dawson, the Hawk. Tony Phillips, I don't know what it is about the only Oakland A's guys, but I had the pleasure of coaching this guy, man. Crazy. That's all I can tell you. He's a little bit on the crazy side. Good ball player, probably one of the best leadoff hitters you're going to ever want to meet. Oh, <laughs> Carlos Diaz. Now, this guy I know. He know they got him here in a dark uniform, but you know that we had him in trade right here in New York. He was in New York for a little while. Left-hand pitcher. Not a not power pitcher. One of those guys that you know, believe in... Um, spotting the ball, but typical left-hander, man. Tricky. That's what they all are. Oh! Now this one right here. Everybody know this guy. Don Maddenly. Now, I've met a lot of great first basemen. Alright? This guy could do it all. Great defensive player. Could hit. If you hadn't gotten injured, you might have saw him play a few more years. Probably one of the best first base you ever see. I put him along with Keith Hernandez. Great guy. Great Yankee, and I'm sure all you guys know you're still managing down in Florida right there. Good guy, man. This is my last guy, great guy, Jim Rice. It's a local guy from South Carolina, Anderson, South Carolina. We all know about Jim Rice, power hitter with the Boston Red Sox. Has a good years. Hall of Famer, I think he is. He deserves his soul. Love this guy, very quiet, and he had put some great numbers over in Boston. So all you Boston fans, don't forget about Jim Rice.